good morning. I'm uh, very, very excited to be here. I think this is a, uh, a really cool uh, opportunity and cool uh, discussion that we're going to have. Uh, briefly, what we're going to do is we're going to go through something uh, called the New Artist Checklist, which is something that I put together, and it was actually something that Kristen Thompson and I came up with. It was an idea we came up with while we were at a conference, and just that we get asked basic questions all the time, like, what do I do? What do I need to do to get started? How do I just do the, the, the basics? What are the things I need to do right away? And we just started putting this list together. And it evolved into uh, this list, which we're going to kind of work from. Chad and Jared are going to pass them out. They're over here. Chad and Jared, raise your hands over here. They're going to pass them out. Now, I didn't realize we were going to have as many people here as we do, so everybody's going to have to share. So uh, it's a good opportunity to. Uh, do some network, all right? Get to know your neighbor, all right? So look on with your neighbor. Um, what I'd like to do initially is, is just uh, start uh, here and maybe each one of my uh, esteemed panelists can briefly introduce themselves and then we will jump right into it and tell you in the next uh, 53 minutes everything you need to know about how to be successful in music business. Uh, my name is Perry Resnick. I'm a business manager with RZO. I'm also an artist representative on the board of Sound Exchange. And I'm involved with the managers forum as well, and uh, always involved with artist rights. Um, hi, everybody. Welcome. So glad to see you at the Future Music Coalition Policy Summit. My name is Marcy Rauer Wagman. I'm an associate professor um, in, at Drexel University in Philadelphia in the Bachelor of Science in the Institute Program. It's former program director, um, where I founded and became CEO of Mad Dragon Unlimited, which is a full service entertainment entity, including Mad Dragon Records, Mad Dragon Publishing, Draco Booking Agency, Mad Dragon Concerts, Mad Dragon Music Video Productions, Mad Dragon Media Artist Services and Mad Merch, and um, so we did a lot. All student run, all faculty led. I'm also an attorney, an entertainment attorney with Wagner Harwich, and um, we have also a business called Record Label and Box, which is an artist services and consulting company um, where we perform label services for artists, but you get to keep everything. Hey everybody, I'm Erin McKeown. I'm the I wear a lot of hats, but uh, first and biggest hat is a musician, a writer, and producer. And this fall, um, I'm celebrating 10 years uh, after my first record. My name is Paul Rapp. I'm an entertainment attorney uh, based in the western part of Massachusetts in the Berkshire Mountains. Um, and I'm also a Musician, um, a drummer with a band called Lotto, which is guilty of foisting a song called I Want to Be a Lifeguard and the, the public. And we just celebrated our 30th uh, anniversary. Of our first record. Okay, uh, so that we can kind of guide the conversation, uh, I, I'd like to get a quick show of hands. Everybody in the room who is an artist, please raise your hand. Okay, uh, of you artists, how many of you uh, are just are working your, your working yourself and putting your own music out? Is there anybody signed to a label here? All right, published not yet. What about publishing? <laughs> All right. Okay, great. Um, uh, one other quick bit of housekeeping I, I wanted to say is if you are tweeting, use hashtag FMC10. FMC10, and also the uh, I forgot to ask my uh, panelists if you are tweeting. What are your Twitter handles, Marcy? Mine's Marcy R W. Please follow me. I also have um, a blog, Musicitis at WordPress. WordPress. I'm on Facebook too. I love it all. Do it all. So please friend me. I will friend you back. Uh, I'm. Pretty simple for me at Aaron McCown on Twitter. Uh, mine is paulrap.com, that's D O T C O M, written out. Uh, I've also got a blog wrap on this at uh, blogspot.com, um, and, and I'm uh, uh, an addict to Facebook. If Facebook disappeared, my life would cease to have any. <laughs> <laughs> I, I work behind the scenes. So I don't, I don't, I don't, 
<laughs> All right, cool. And uh, mine is, uh, my Twitter handle is at Brian Calhoun, B R Y A N C A L H O U N. Okay, so hopefully everybody's got the uh, handouts now. And I um, actually have it up on the screen too. But really, what I want to do is I'm kind of going to run through what we feel like are some of the most important things that you should address. And then what we'll do is I'll start throwing questions uh, back and forth to uh, the panelists and get their perspectives on how we should handle so many things. But I also want to make sure we leave uh, enough time to answer uh, questions that you guys may have. So the uh, number one thing on our list here is to register your copyrights. And something I think is really important and I think oftentimes it goes unsaid is that everybody needs to understand that there are two separate copyrights in every sound recording. Uh, there is the underlying composition and the master recording, the sound recording. And what I, Marcy, did you, I, we were talking, I didn't put you out, we were on the spot, we, uh, we were talking about it outside, I'd love to hear the way you describe those two sounds, those two uh, copyrights. Uh, well, okay, uh, the song is sort of an intangible thing. If I just sang to you, la, it's sort of intangible, sorry for that, if it broke anybody's ear drums. But it's an intangible, so when we talk about a composition, we're talking about the, the melody and the lyrics. Sometimes it's just an instrumental without lyrics, so that's what we're talking about. Um, when you write down a song, you're fixing the song. When you take a piece of paper and you start to write notes and everything, you're fixing that song. That song becomes something tangible. But another part of tangibility is the sound recording. The sound recording is even more than that. It's taking the melody, taking the lyrics, and creating fixed sounds that exist on a particular recording, like the particular bass part, the particular piano part, the particular vocal part. All of those sounds exist on the sound recording. These two things, the song and the sound recording, are actually separate copyrightable elements. In other words, they are entitled to rights under the Copyright Act if you are the owners of these two separate things. And they have different, they go back to, the songs actually go back to 1909, copyright act, and it's one of our clients is the Gershwin family, and they, when George Gershwin wrote Rhapsody in Blue, the song is, has a copyright going back to 1909, you know, when it was written back in the early 1900s, but the, if, you, if there was a recording of it, that wasn't protected until the late 70s. Yeah, 1972. 72, early 70s. Right. Right. Uh, okay, so we'll talk a little bit about uh, making sure that you, properly register uh, those copyrights. Um, drafting an agreement between the individual band members uh, is uh, another key component. Uh, making sure that you get trademarks for your name and logo. Forming uh, a company or companies as necessary. Uh, and I, I think uh, Perio has some uh, interesting insight into that. Uh, Picking a performing rights organization, uh, ASCAP, BMI, or CSAC as a writer. And going back to uh, Marcy and her description of the underlying composition or the song, those organizations collect uh, for those. Um, registering with Sound Exchange, which is the company that I work for, uh, it's a performing rights organization, and we collect for artists and labels for the use of the sound recording. Uh, when your works are played on digital services like internet radio, satellite radio, cable radio. Uh, in fact, we just sent out our biggest distribution ever last week, $65 million. This is very exciting. Um, arranging for distribution, and we can talk about physical and digital distribution. Uh, embedding your metadata on each track and file that you send out. Uh, it, is can sort of sound like a boring topic, but it is arguably one of the biggest problems facing the music industry today is the lack of uh, good quality information so that we know who to pay. Uh, registering your website, and your social networks, I know there was a discussion this morning about how to do some of those things. Uh, looking at other organizations uh, like the unions and so forth that can help you out. Uh, building your web presence, getting health insurance, Hint. Um, and building uh, your team and making sure that all of these things get handled by the appropriate professionals. And then, uh, of course, I think everything starts with great, great music. So, with that being said, uh, why don't, I mean, we can just start from the top or work our way down. And uh, I'd love to go ahead and uh, maybe 
uh, um, Paul, you can talk a little bit about the uh, about the drafting an agreement between uh, band members. I know something that I've seen many times is you know when you're in the beginning stages, everything is great, it's all love, everybody loves everybody, they're making great music. Then money starts to come in and everything goes up the window. Yeah. Um, starting out, I mean, you don't need an elaborate agreement, I, I don't think, and you don't need to worry about incorporating or forming an LLC. But if you don't do anything and you're a group of people, chances are the law is going to treat you uh, as a partnership. And uh, the one thing I think you want to address in an agreement is what to do with a member leaves uh, the band. And this way it's sort of like a prenup because you're sort of you know, talking about what happens when everything goes to hell. Um, but if you don't have an agreement, most states say that they, they will deem you a partnership. Uh, and if someone leaves the group um, under most state partnership laws, when, the, when a partner leaves uh, the partnership, the partnership automatically dissolves. It's just gone. And the only thing the partnership can do then is wind up its business value, what it has, and split everything among the partners. So, um, and that's not the way, obviously, bands work. Um, but you know what happens is if you don't have an agreement on how to how to deal with uh, a leaving member, you know when you, when you kick the dweeby rich guy out of your band and he runs to mommy and daddy and they call uh, the family attorney, you know suddenly you're going to find out that maybe your band doesn't exist anymore. So you should have just some kind of agreement that if someone leaves the band, you know either voluntarily or is kicked out, um, that that simply the band will go on, the partnership will, will continue to go on, and that will over, overrule the presumption that it arises by, uh, by state law. Uh, the other thing to talk about is, is songwriting. It's very important to be able to define uh, who the songwriters are. Uh, some bands go song by song and say, you know, I mean, sometimes it's clear. Sometimes it's one member of the band that, that writes the songs, and, and, and that's clear. Uh, sometimes it's not as clear if the band is really working collaboratively to get together and the song kind of spontaneously comes up. Uh, you can sit down and say who's got what percentage uh, of, of what song and go song by song. Uh, I find that to be kind of tedious and it can be very contentious as well. I mean, every band is different, but if the band has uh, a process that's fairly consistent, you know, say one, one person or two people, you know, bring in the germ of the song and then the rest of the band fills the song in, uh, I would suggest that a one-size you know, fits all agreement, that the person that brings in the germ of, of the song maybe gets 50% and the rest of the band splits the other, the other 50% uh, or something like that and have that in writing. Uh, because you don't, you don't want a situation where the band is getting together to write a song and a guy is saying, well, I want to rewrite the bridge because if I rewrite the bridge, that means I'm going to have 25% of the song. You want them to rewrite the bridge because it's going to make the song better. You want that to be the, the, the fundamental thing you're thinking about. Uh, so those two things should be, I think, in a band agreement right from the beginning. You know, how to deal with a leading member and what the songwriting uh, splits are going to look like. And if there's also performing splits as well um, in terms of mm -hmm. recording. If you do make a record and there are royalties from the record, that may be split differently than the songs are split. If somebody writes most of the songs, they might get most of the songwriter royalties, but if you're all performing together, generally it's more equal. Unless it's a you know, front man, of course. Mm -hmm. Just one of the things, the name, you know, of the band. There's many times that, and I think we're going to talk about that a little bit, but the name has value attached to it <coughs> as well. That should be addressed. Right. You know, that's actually, uh, it's, a, it's a good segue into actually two other things, and, and I want to throw back Perry. You talked about, like, the, the company, forming a company. Uh, you know, I know like there's megastar artists that have one company for their merchandising, another company for their publishing, another company for touring, another company for this and that. You know, for, for the fledgling artists, like where do you start? Recognizing that there are these separate copyrights and an agreement, you know, hopefully that uh, now you, you've talked to Paul and you've got your agreement with the band. Like what, are the, what do you need to form uh, legally in terms of having the appropriate setup? Well, you really want to make sure that you protect yourself legally if there are any kinds of accidents, any kind of, if you do a lot of touring, you definitely want to have insurance, you want to have uh, liability insurance, you want to have uh, equipment insurance for whether it's lost or damaged, there's a lot of equipment theft out there on the road, and also from I've had producers have kind of installed in their apartments and things like that, so you want, equipment insurance to me is one of the most important things you can do. 
protect yourself. A couple hundred dollars a year, and it'll really help. Uh, and then as far as if you're on the road a lot, you may want to do an S corporation, which is a, a limits your liability. It's basically an individual, but they, they, it's uh, recognized by the government as a corporation, and it limits your liability so that you can't be sued personally. You don't, they won't be able to sue the corporation if there's an accident of some sort. And there's all sorts of different variations. There's LLCs, which is a little more complicated. But for people generally starting out, right, they wouldn't need to do more than the S corporation probably. Okay, and then so in terms of, uh, so you've got your company, you've got your band agreement. Uh, in, in terms of the actual process of registering the copyrights, what does that process entail? Throw it out there. Oh, well, uh, <coughs> registering your copyrights is easy peasy these days, basically. I mean, if you go to copyright.gov, they have a comprehensive form, Form CO now and um, all you have to do really is go on there they have a, they have a there's a <coughs> instructions about how to fill out this form it's really not that expensive to to do if you do it as a collection let's say you've written 12 songs for an LP 10 songs 12 songs whatever you can still do it as a collection under certain circumstances they have certain restrictions but you generally can do it I think it's I don't know $35 I don't know they, they keep changing the rate but you can do it all online now so it's where, where? Oh, it's copyright.gov. Just go to www.copyright.gov. It's really, it's very simple um, to do now. I think they've streamlined the process a lot for um, not only performing artists, but other kinds of artists as well. There used to be separate forms. There used to be PA and SR and TX and all these others, but they have this form CO. I, they, I think they call it a little E, big CO now. Eco, maybe because it's eco-friendly and they thought it was cute, you know. But, um, but they, they have an uh, or e-commerce. Yeah, it could be anything, you know. Yeah, or and copyright. Just what a wonderful name. So um, just go ahead and do it. It's pretty easy. Um, the the trademark is a little bit more complicated than copyright for a variety of reasons. But you can learn a lot about trademark basics on the USPTO.gov website. <coughs> that stands for the United States Patent and Trademark Office, and they do have trademark basis, basis, uh, basic, uh, you know, checklist. What is a trademark? What do you, you know, need? Why you need to register? Those kinds of things. So it could answer a lot of questions. The other thing that that uh, website does have is what's called a TEAS application, T-E-A-S, the Trademark Electronic Application Service, and you can online register your trademark, but uh, there's, trademarks are, are actually quite more complicated than copyrights. The law is more complicated with reference to trademarks, um, and generally it's a more complex process. I do suggest if you're really having trouble with it, you don't want to mess it up because you can't do it over again. There's really no do-overs. So you may want to think about getting an attorney for that or someone that actually knows about registering trademarks for that. Um, there's different kinds of classes, for example, that you might want to, that you need to register for now. Nowadays, they have like an entertainment services class. They also have merchandise classes now, too. So if you're selling merch in any way, you might have to register for that class as well. Then you also have to think about the federal trademark as opposed to global trademark. We're using our trademarks globally now. So again, it's a more complicated process than, than the copyright. In terms of the copyright, be very patient with their electronic filing <laughs> system. It is about the most frustrating. It's like web, you know, it's like internet point zero five. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's primitive. It's not intuitive. Just take a deep breath, and you'll be able to get through it. Um, trademark. I mean, the first thing you want to do when you come upon a band is make sure that nobody else is using it because you don't want to. You know, spend a lot of energy and, and money into building your platform and building your brand uh, to find out that somebody else actually owns the rights. You know, and a Google search is going to get you, you know, 99% of the way there. You know, if there's a band out there, they're going to be, you know, on on Google somewhere. Uh, and then it becomes well, if it's if the word if, if the name is close, you know, if they're not in this country. You know, I, I've had you know people run in and say, you know, oh, oh my God, there's a you know a band of teenagers in Australia using our name. You know, and you know, and you go on. They have a MySpace page, which has had like four visits, and you realize they're just a, you know, a bunch of knuckleheads playing in the basement. I said, don't worry about it. Um, but you do want to make sure that you don't, you, you know, you don't step in it by by using somebody else's uh, 
Yeah, I just want to mention they do have a search engine on the USPTO.gov too, so you can actually search for federal trademarks. To see if, if somebody, yeah. Yeah, if somebody's TV. got one registered, uh, then, then you know they're serious. But right. you know, a lot of bands will be out there playing and will not have a registered trademark. Uh, but as long as they're using it, they're going to have priority over over you. Uh, and so you just want to you know, make sure that somebody else out there hasn't done it already. <coughs> Yeah, I, I want to get Aaron involved, and I think this is a, 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 good, a good point to do so. Uh, you know, when, when you kind of look at uh, the, the entire ecosystem for, uh, for, for musicians, you have essentially, everything is based sort of on these three things. We talked about the copyright in sound recording, and there's the, the copyright in uh, the, the, the song or the composition, and then there's this other thing, which is kind of everything else. And it's like your, your right of publicity, your brand capital. And sort of in talking about uh, uh, you know the, the trademarking, and we've already started touching on you know your web presence and, and so forth. Uh, Aaron, could you jump in and kind of talk a little bit about the importance in that protecting your 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 brand? Because you are a brand. Yeah, I mean, I think as as an artist who works under their own name, um, you know, I'm, I'm listening like, man, I didn't trademark my name. <laughs> what is that? What are the consequences? Um, I mean, I think on a practical level, listening to what's been said so far as an artist, um, uh, some of this, you, some of this, I can do right away, and some of this I can't. In terms of it's like priority, um, what do I have money for? What do I have time for? Um, <coughs> in terms of protecting, in terms of protecting yourself, um, you know, and prioritizing things. The, I've been working with a business manager since 2002, and. I wouldn't say that they're actually the most important part of my team um, in terms of like my my day-to-day -day life and also this type of protection stuff. Um, I have an S corporation and I have a DBA. And right now that's how my thing is set up under this name, Aaron. <coughs> um, and in terms of protecting it further than that, um, I don't, to be totally honest, <laughs> I don't. Um, but uh, I think consistency has been something that's important to me. And um, both within how I've used my name and where I've used my name, and also um, in terms of, of my team. OK. I, I, I want to go ahead and uh, try to get, make sure we're getting through all these things and leave enough time for, for questions. But for, for the independent artists I hear who are writing their own material, who here is registered with ASCAP, BMI, or CSAC as a writer? All right, excellent. Um, Are you registered with Sound Exchange? That was my next question. You registered with Sound Exchange. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, so uh, I think you, most of you are probably familiar with ASCAP, BMI, or CSAC. But I, I'd like for one of my panelists to kind of just jump in and talk a little bit about that. And then I can talk a little bit about Sound Exchange. Who wants to, who wants to feel this one? Um, ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC are what's known as performing rights organizations. Essentially, they collect revenue from public performances and any and all media um, for the composition. That's what they do. So basically, with the, who they serve, their population that they serve are songwriters, the authors, and the publishers. That's their population. Um, and you can sign up for ASCAP and BMI. I, th I think at CSAC you still need to apply for CSAC and, and get it into CSAC. But for ASCAP and BMI, you sign up for them when you think you're going to get any kind of airplay. We're talking about radio or television or any or the internet, or any kind of any kind of airplay whatsoever, because airplay means public performances and vice versa, essentially. Um, whereas, should you contrast it with sound exchange? Bar, 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 bar. Okay, okay. That, that's basically what it is. So sign up for it. Oh, by the way, if you're going to sign up with ASCAP and BMI, um, please sign up as a, both a writer and a publisher. You're going to have to pick a publishing company name. I think in ASCAP, I know you get five choices, and whichever one isn't used is your publishing company. <laughs> so the reason for that is because they collect public performances for both shares. There's two separate shares of income. If you don't sign up as a publishing company, you're not going to get that share of income. Um, so you do want to make sure you're a writer publisher member. Before you get the sound exchange, also, the other thing about ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC is they have agreements with other societies around the world. 
So if you, for some reason, everybody's on the internet, obviously, you have your music on the internet. So if some blogger in Finland picks up your song and it's all of a sudden getting played in Finland on some Finnish you know, uh, internet radio station, then that'll come through the <coughs> Collection Society. They'll pay it over to ASCAP or BMI or CC. It'll eventually get to you. It takes a while, but it'll eventually get to you. Mm -hmm. for, for a long time, I was counseling uh, clients before the internet, really, counseling clients not to get too worked up about ASCAP and BMI because it really you know, didn't click in until you started getting airplay, and especially when radio started tightening up. You know, and I, and I had clients who had sort of fetishized it, you know, th th those people who grew up with vinyl records, uh, you know, when you look at the liner notes and all the songs would say BMI or ASCAP, and you go, oh, and then you're, you know, your record would come out and you'd have to, you know, and I've got clients who would like to join and then get a, a personal rep in New York and call them and visit them. And, you know, these are people that made a record and sold 50 copies and they're like all excited about ASCAP BMI. It's really important now, especially if you've got songs going out, and you're placing them in some of these um, licensing services like Rumblefish or Pump or you know, Flick Tracks or any of those, uh, because your stuff may be getting played on commercials or TV shows, and you won't even know, you know, until you get your statement uh, from from the service. Uh, and you want that stuff to get, you know, and and when when that stuff does get played on TV shows and commercials, you will also get money through through the PRO. Uh, so I think it's really important to these days more than ever to sign up. Actually, you're already, you're already. I was going to let you talk about sound exchange first, and then I have a comment on where all this fits for the internet. Yeah, actually, I wanted to have you kind of tie it all in together after we get through a few of these things. So, real quickly, sound exchange is similar to ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC in that we are a performing rights organization, <coughs> a nonprofit uh, company. And, uh, but, but in contrast, we collect for the performer, so the person who sings the song. So if Marcy writes a song and Perry sings it, and it comes out on Brian Records, and that recording is played on an Amar FM radio station, uh, I don't get paid, Perry does not get paid, but Marcy as the writer does get paid. Now, an example I use is Jimi Hendrix doing like a Rolling Stone. Because you know, everybody knows Jimi Hendrix doing like a Rolling Stone, which was written by Bob Dylan. So he gets the he gets the song royalties and Jimmy gets the performance royalties. The performance royalties. Absolutely. So when that when that is performed on uh, digital services like satellite radio, internet radio like Pandora, and I, know, I know Tim is going to be here. Uh, I think tomorrow Tim Westergren from Pandora or cable radio ch channels like uh, Music uh, was it uh, Dish and Music Choice. Those services pay sound exchange and then we in turn pay the performers and the owners of the sound recording. Now if you uh, most of you all in the art in the audience are artists who release your own material. That means you own the sound recording as well as being a performer, which means you're entitled to both of those revenue streams. So when you do register with Sound Exchange, because that's what everybody's going to do when they leave here, make sure that you register as both the owner of the sound recording as well as a performer, so that you can receive both of those royalties. Uh, one of the biggest challenges that I face, and I, I run the outreach department at Sound Exchange is encouraging artists and labels to register with us. We literally have tens of millions of dollars for artists and labels sitting in the bank account because the artists have not registered to claim their money. We've contacted, and actually I talked about this at a, at a meeting on Friday, is we've contacted in excess of 40,000 artists who we have money for, not might have money one day in the future, but we actually have money for, and only about 10% of those have actually registered to collect their money. So, if you are getting your uh, recordings currently played on any of those services, you should definitely visit soundexchange.com. Uh, and, and I want to touch on one other thing because it, 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 it relates to that, is the importance of making sure that you have all of the appropriate metadata associated with your recording when you give it to somebody. When SoundExchange uh, uh, does their calculations and we get the reports of use, uh, which are basically playlists from the services, we look and see, what recordings were played, who performed, what the label was, and then we pay those people. Now, if the service got a CD from someone and the CD was just track number three by various artists and promo only is all the information that they have, who do we pay? There's really no one we can pay. So what we need to do is make sure that all of you guys, it starts with you all. When you come out of the studio, make sure that you include all the appropriate metadata with your recordings before you start distributing it. <coughs> um, so I want to yeah. go ahead and let Aaron uh, jump in now and kind of tie some of these things together because I think one of the things that's interesting is, is Aaron, you've had experience 
as an artist signed to a big label, signed an indie label, you're putting your own recordings out now. Uh, some of the things that uh, we're, we're doing here are on the checklist were things that weren't, weren't on a checklist 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to make a quick point about the metadata, metadata <coughs> because we don't get back to it. I have a last name that's hard to spell. I have a last name that people confuse a lot. And um, I recently, if I look up myself on ASCAP, and I forget where the space goes between the C or the K, or if what's capitalized or not, sometimes I can't find myself on ASCAP. <laughs> like, that's one, that's one thing for me. And the other, the other thing about the metadata is that on, um, you know, I'm going to admit that late night I searched for myself on YouTube. <laughs> but it's also part of my business. It's also important for me to be like knowing what's out there and looking at what, you know, people are filming about me or other things that I've done. I often, you know, I often like check out like, well, how did that webcast go? How did that radio station thing go? Recently, um, I did something in France and forgot about it, never thought about it again, but a venue searched for me on YouTube as an example of a video to put up on, a, on, a, uh, on their uh, calendar. And this, this uh, company in France spelled my name a certain way and didn't include in the tags any other options around it. I've never, I've never found this video spelling my name correctly and looking for it. And then I find this other thing. And it's like, thank God it's great. It's awesome. It was something I agreed to do. But I would never have found it if I hadn't found it this backwards way. Um, so I think like the, the metadata thing is, is power, honestly. It's power, especially if you're, you're really like working things on your own, which is possible, flexible, and awesome in the new world. But from the beginning, embedding the correct information is going to help you out instead of letting someone guess how to spell your name or spell it in some Wait, something like Google will correct you. I often say that people don't respond to my name. I'm like, well, just put in like MCK something, and Google is going to get you for us. But um, other services like Sound Exchange may not. So um, tying this all together, um, yeah, 10 years ago when I, I, I joined ASCAP uh, in 1998. And I joined ASCAP because somebody wrote me an email that they were going to use a song from a cassette of mine in a film. And I, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what that meant, I didn't know what to do. I had a friend of a friend who worked in film and TV at ASCAP. And that's how I joined. You know, I didn't make a choice between CSAC or BMI, I just knew somebody, and I knew that I needed to do something fast. Um, and all, so 10 years ago, when my first record came out, my income was about people buying CDs. It was about me being on tour and me selling my CDs at the end of the night. That was how I, that was how I made my money. Um, you all know the story. This is the case now. It's not the case now. For me, most of my income comes from things like Sound Exchange, from ASCAP. Um, I have a lot of songs that have been placed in TV and movies, which is awesome. And that sometimes that floats me. Like if I can't go on the road, or I don't want to go on the road, or I'm like, God forbid, I'm taking some time to write music. <laughs> right? An ASCAP check or a Sound Exchange check is going to get me through that month. Okay. Yeah. That's awesome. All right. Well, uh, what about? Yeah. 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 Oh yeah, now Perry, you, you definitely see this <laughs> in, in, in the audience and stuff that you have. Yeah, yeah. yeah, one of the things that I do for my clients is we do audits of record companies and music publishers and record royalties are way down from what they were back even five years ago. Just as an yeah, example. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Just as an example, I mean I, I just saw that it went to number one in the bottom rock charts and billboard in nineteen eighty eight and I'm still getting royalties from ASCAP and BMI from all over the world and all the so it's really nice when you get those <laughs> checks. I, I want to say one thing about, uh, real quick, just about uh, distribution, um, and then I want to get to the audience for questions. But uh, you know, I work at Sound Exchange. I also work with uh, on the side. I help some guys out there. It's a management company called Hip Hop since 1978. They manage clients like Kanye West and Lil Wayne and Young Jeezy and this artist named Drake, but, but which. Oh, uh, maybe you've heard of this. <laughs> um, but when, uh, uh, before they did a deal with uh, Cash Money and they were just kind of working his record, uh, I took a song and used TuneCore to put it up online so that it could be bought on iTunes and Napster. <coughs> now, these guys had some clout and you know they were able to you know work the system and it was a record that was starting to get a pretty significant amount of uh, 
radio play, he was selling out little venues already. But when we put the song up, in 10 days, we had sold 300,000 downloads. And at 70 cents, which is what you get paid directly, that's $210,000. So the money that they had invested in developing his career, they made back really quickly. Now, that's an extreme case, but it does kind of show the power of, of uh, distributing product yourself and that you can do it. We didn't need universal music. We didn't need any of that stuff. You know, it's funny about that. Pandora can, can do the same type of thing. We had an artist named Andrew Lipke on a record label, Mad Dragon Records, and we put his stuff up on Tunecore and the Four Yard Deal, and you would see the digital airplay, the little onesies and twosies for everything, and then suddenly 748 <coughs> downloads for this one song. It's, by the way, it's up to about 6,000, 7,000 downloads, and this is just a local you know, artist. I mean, where is this coming from? How come one song, you know, all the rest of the songs getting two, three, four, and then 700? Well, we found out that Andrew Whitkey's song comes up next to a Jack Johnson song on Pandora. So people were listening to Jack Johnson radio, Andrew Whitkey's song, the song Stick By You, comes up and buying it. And so the same power. So don't forget that Pandora will last that power. Right. Okay. So we've got uh, a little less than 20 minutes. I want to make sure that we have the opportunity to answer questions. So let's get it started. Yes. Well, hi, my name is David Baskin. I'm the president of CMRRA in Toronto, Canada. And it's a very quick commercial. ASCAP, EMI, CSAC, great organizations. If you want money and your songs are getting sold in Canada, whether it's by iTunes or on satellite radio or otherwise, you should sign up with us as well. By signing up with ASCAP or BMI or CZAC, you do hook up with SOCAN, the Canadian Performing Rights Society. But if you own your own copyrights, if you own your own publisher, we'd be delighted to work with you. I'll be here uh, for the next three days and happy to talk to anybody. We distribute millions of dollars and we are just about to announce a uh, probably the largest legal settlement in Canadian history from the major record labels on their so-called pending lists. The money they've been holding, theoretically, because they couldn't find you. So come and see. Back. Yes. Um, can you explain metadata? Because I work, you know, on the side of artists and helping them get stuff set up. And I say to them, make sure that you have the metadata, and they don't understand. And I and I feel like that's <coughs> just something they don't understand to make sure when they're sure. sure. Down. So metadata is the information around your recording. Someone described it as the DNA of your of your recording of your song. It's all of the information. So it's uh, who is the performer? Who's the owner of the sound recording? And it can get very deep. It can be, uh, you know, all of the, the, the writer splits, where this where the song was recorded, what studio it was recorded in. It can be, this is all the information that goes along with it. At a very base level, what is most important is making sure that you have the correct writer, writer and publisher information and the uh, owner of the sound recording, the owner of the master, and the performer. So at a base level, that, those would be most important things. And when you are in the process of mastering your record, if you're using uh, you know, some home studio equipment, most of that stuff all the way up to the, you know, the high-end uh, studios, mastering facilities, they can embed that information in your recording before you distribute it. All right, yes, very good. Um, you guys talked a little bit about the scenario where you have a band who's trying to copyright something and the band owns the copyright. Could you address briefly the scenario that we see a lot in hip hop where you have a producer who wants to keep their interest in the beat that they've created so that they can use that in other things and a lyricist who wants to keep their interest in the vocals and the lyrics that they've written and how they go about protecting their rights in that scenario. <laughs> I think there should be a written agreement between the, the producer and the and, and the rapper in this situation because I think the law would treat them as joint authors where they each have this undivided right to the whole song and they can each go out and, and, and do whatever they want with it. Uh, so I think for something like this you would want a written agreement where the producer who created the beats, you know, typically would get 50% you know, of, of the song. Uh, but have it segmented out and say, you know, like he, he, he owns the beat and he's able to go out and use it for other things and have, have the rapper or the, the record label, if there is one, uh, acknowledge that. And that's how they're getting the bottle of salmon, too. So, yeah. Similar. Similar. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think, I think Paul's right. I, I certainly, you know, see that uh, quite a bit. And, you know, that's what I like to do is just to spell it out. Say, you know, if the producer, you know, has made something for the local guy in the neighborhood and then Jay-Z calls and say, I want to use the beat, there should be some kind of an out in, in the agreement, uh, as Paul said, that gives me the ability to do that. When you register it, are you registering it as a joint work or can you register just the instrumental and just the lyrics and then? You know, well, in my, in my experience, it depends. <laughs> I mean, it always depends on what people agree to. Um, you know, I, I work with some producers who actually just license the beats to the people that, you know, we'll, we'll work with. Um, some who just give it to them exclusively because they always know they can. One producer says to me, I can always do another beat, you know. Um, so, yeah, so it really depends. But listen, I mean, really, a contract comes down to whatever a bunch of people can agree upon. Honestly, and, um, and and that's really what it's about. And I just want to make mention. You bring up a good point. Don't walk into a studio without a producer agreement. If you have a producer, that's just ridiculous. you're setting yourself up for these kinds of things. Where someone says, "Oh, I wrote that song. Did I write? I wrote part of that song." The producer says that, and the artist thinks that they didn't. And so you start setting yourself up for issues. Yeah, that kind of also, you know, what's the definition of a producer in the first place? Right. So it, it can be get really complicated to get for here. Um, I kind of have a related question. I'm kind of starting out as an artist from scratch. So um, I don't even care about the, the session, but um, kind of like with record labels, I can make decent quality like, recordings on a laptop. So when is it still necessary for me to kind of um, go for an independent label or something like that to help me get my music out there? Or can I do it myself? And then I guess the second question is, um, Kind of, who is the first and person, important person when you're looking to help get your career started? Like, who are you looking for? Like, a PR person or like kind of a business manager, as you said? Well, speaking from the perspective of a business manager, I would say you need a manager first, an artist manager, obviously, who is basically your partner in the crime, so to speak, and you, uh, they're the ones who will guide your career in conjunction with you, obviously. Business managers later on, but uh, you have to be making some money to have a business manager. Like, you're making some way to have a manager a lot. True, true, true. true. Just, you know, no, no one wants to manage an act that's not making any money. You know, if you if all you if you're a manager, you make money because it, you help your client generate revenue, which is commissionable. If you have a client that makes, you know, a dollar, you know, it's not a good way. Right. But a manager makes involved with a lot of the creative areas as well. Sure. As a business manager, we do nothing at all. Creative, <laughs> just handle the business. You know, we just handle the money. I think just starting out, one of the most important things you can have is somebody to do the social networking. If you're not going to do it yourself, have somebody else who's, who's good at it uh, do it. Ariel Hyatt, I think last year, uh, said you know, that she thought every group should have a non-performing member uh, who full-time worked social networking uh, to get the word out. I, I've had clients get deals, get management deals, and get record deals, who put their stuff on you know MySpace back when it mattered, or you know whatever. <laughs> networking there is, and that's how they, they got knowledge, uh, and they worked it. You know, they, they made sure that they got their stuff out, uh, and, and so I think that's very, very important. Uh, I think to answer your question about labels, um, and then I, I have some questions <coughs> about the team stuff. Um, you know, I uh, started out putting my own music out, kind of before the internet was involved. Uh, then I was on a small independent label, and then I was on a label with major distribution. Then I went back to the small independent label, then I went back to an even smaller independent label that has a, um, my last record came out from Righteous Bay Records, which is on the Franco's label. Um, and I don't know what I'm going to do next, but my current feeling is don't, don't sign with the label. Don't sign with the label. You don't need them. You really don't. What you need is knowledge. What you need is someone to help you do the office work and start there. In terms of a team, um, in terms of a team, again, like I've had a whole range of experiences. Um, this spring, I stopped working with my manager. I worked with that person for 10 years, um, and I had another manager before that. And um, I'm currently thinking out loud about the structure of an artist team. And I'm going to go on record and say right now, I don't know that you need a manager. I don't know that you need a manager. I know that you need an agent to help you get out on the road. I know you need certainly a project manager. You have an idea. 
you need a project manager. Um, and I think I think a business manager, again, as I said, is, is also important. Maybe you need a lawyer. Maybe your lawyer is the first person to start working with because this is all really confusing this, to put this all together. Um, again, as an independent artist, when you're thinking about your team, think about your own time and your own time management. What do you want to spend time on? And for every artist, that's a really individual difference. There's some artists that don't care about this stuff, <coughs> or there's some artists that really like get off on it. I happen to really like thinking about this stuff, and I'm, I gotta say I'm kind of loving having a lot of things on my plate that other people have been doing for me for a long time. Um, my problem right now is time management. Like what is it important for me to be doing and what can I ask other people to do? But I think we're at this point right now in terms of putting together a team with all the things that the internet is offering us right now where these different roles are really in flux. And I don't, I don't say that to insult anyone who's a manager here at all. Please, please don't take it that way. But I want to think about a new way that, that roles of helping artists can change with all these other options that are out here. One, oh, uh, I just want to say one of the things, that's one of the reasons we, we have a consulting company record label in a box, essentially it responds to exactly what you were talking about, where you can perform, there's a team of people who can perform all of the art <coughs> services that a label would normally provide to you, but it's a pay-as-you-go basis, essentially. So you're not, not exclusive, you know, you keep your independence, you keep all of your profits, you keep all of your copyrights, and you can get out whenever you want, essentially. And it's targeted directly to an artist. And I think that's where things are headed, rather than you know having record labels now who kind of own everything. I think the flip is starting to happen. We have artists instead of record labels hiring artists to be on the label. We have artists hiring teams of people like at, like our consulting services to do these kinds of things for them, so they can go out and do what they do best, which is create music and you know finally hone their craft and live performance and things like that. And I think that's really where things are headed in that direction, so I think you're coming at a very good time, especially for a new and emerging artist. And I'm sorry, by the way, you can uh, you can register lyrics separately, and you can register music separately. I, I can actually answer your questions. <laughs> yeah, I, I just, as a, as a musician, I had some comments. I, I know Aaron was talking about um, uh, building a team, and, and maybe speaking towards the FMC and, and its importance. I know that, as a musician, the first place that you find these people to help you out, you know, project managers or however you, whatever you want to call them, your hands and help. Um, our first more or less super fans are people that want to be involved, people that you meet on the road, people that you meet in the process. But um, from the panel's perspective, you know what's the importance of things like FMC, where you have you have large groups of people that are trying to to progress in their careers here, and you know some of these other outlets other than just employing fans or employing people that want to come up to you and have help. I'll take that question. Um, you know, one of the things that I think is, uh, it's a testament to what you guys are trying to do by actually being in the room. Uh, I find it incredibly frustrating sometimes trying to convince artists to do what's best in their own interest. Uh, it, it, it is amazing to me sometimes that artists will say, this is what I want to do, I want to spend the rest of my life being a musician and doing this, and won't spend an hour trying to learn the basics of the industry that they're committing their, the rest of their life to. So it's, it's hugely important. I was at a conference uh, last week in Nashville, and they had assembled this tremendous group of, of panelists from all over the country. Uh, to talk about real specific things that you can do to improve your chances for success. And you know, it's in Music City, Nashville, where you go to the, you know, the, uh, the coffee shop and everybody there is trying to be a musician or the shoe store or whatever, and everybody's trying to be a musician. And there were less people there than there were in this room right now. So you need to go to these things, you need to learn. There's a huge amount of resources available to you online. I mean, please take you know the uh, the Nordis checklist and start from there. I mean, that's really this little two-page document is just a starting point. It's, it's really just a starting point. So go to conferences, read blogs. Actually, that's a good question. What do you for new artists uh, and for emerging artists? What are your favorite uh, web resources? Just give me one. Everybody, give me one. Mine's out of web research, but uh, Donald Passman's book, everything you need to know about the music business, <coughs> which the way things are going, it's 
partially out of date every time a new edition comes out because things are happening so quickly. But the basics that we were talking about, about publishing and revenue flows and copyrights and stuff, it's all there and it's all there in a very you know, easily digestible uh, form. Uh, I would put in a plug for something that's also not inherently online, um, which is my union. I am the AFM Local 1000. Local 1000 is the North American Traveling Musicians Union. Yeah. You don't have to be in a particular town, so it's not a local in that sense, the local in this sort of like new global sense. Um, they help me get liability insurance. They help me get musician, uh, musical instrument insurance. They <coughs> offer a pension plan. They can also offer <coughs> health care. Um, they offer a lot of things. It's very affordable. Uh, I also, I believe in unions, and I believe that musicians are like any other occupation, uh, and unions are important. Um, A2IM is the Independent Musicians you know, Coalition, essentially. Um, also, there's a lot, there's so many websites like Digital Music News and Music Dish, and um, Oh my god, I don't know, I get the Pipe Bod. Yeah, Pipe Bod and the Music Industry Report. <coughs> and there's just tons of music industry great websites out there that give you a tremendous amount of information. You really just have to, I think if you spend a half a day on it, probably 20 of them that would be relevant to. You. I read all the long ones too, but. Yeah, I, mean, I get a lot of newsletters as well, so you can learn a lot from the newsletters. There's not a particular um, website I can really throw out there, but to go back to your question, one of the ways these conferences really help is by talking to other people. You see this checklist, you say, oh, this one is what I'm supposed to do, these three things, and then you talk to other people say, well, I do this, and you talk to someone else and say, I do it that way. You kind of do it all together, and you do what works for you, but you, talk, you also get ideas from other people, and that's what these conferences are about. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I recommend uh, Folk Alliance, which is a great Alliance organization, great. And, and the regional conferences of Folk Alliance. The, the main, the main, what the main nat, international comes up in mid to late February, and the regionals are happening right now through, uh, you know, uh, through mid November to the Northeast Regional coming up in mid November. If people aren't committed, Veterans Day weekend, and they're doing anything that's even remotely can be considered acoustic, they should they should go. Uh, anything can be played acoustic, it's not like hard <coughs> or anything. People hear folk and they, they get they, they think it's like a mighty movie and it's not. <laughs> I want to throw something out sort of like a classy thing because I don't want to give one company too much uh, light here, but uh, the companies where they kind of combine uh, online your e-commerce, your CRM, which is your email management system, uh, kind of digital marketing, but there's companies like Topspin, Reverb Nation, <coughs> Nimbit, Cisco EOS, which is kind of for bigger for, for bigger artists. Uh, what was it? No, Ingroove, uh, not Ingroove is more of an aggregator like TuneCore uh, for distribution. But those companies kind of have a really nice packages where you can collect and manage your email lists and uh, sell your product, either digital or physical goods and combinations thereof and so forth. So those are a bunch. And I mentioned Hypebot, which I think is a really uh, great blog for, uh, for new artists. And there's another one that just launched a few months ago, which I think is fantastic. It's called Sandbox.fm. Uh, Gosh, from Music Al, I started it, but it's very specifically focused to the DIY community. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, I'm an, an artist, songwriter, a publisher. I'm releasing a CD and a holiday song in November 19th. I'm signed up with ASCAP. I have the, in some of my songs, I have co write agreements, which I have all the documentation. So I have a publishing company that has the rights under ASCAP. Um, now, and I have my name for my publishing company, now when I take that to, to turning in a publishing company versus a performer, a DBA, an escort, what, what are the legal, what legal uh, entities do I need to create? Or do I? I mean, right now I've been doing everything under my name. Yeah, I think unless you're touring, unless you're doing something where you're going to incur significant, you know, possibility of liabilities, which would be either touring or having a drummer in your band. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think you need to necessarily to you know, form an, an entity. I mean, no, I, 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 I
what, 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 what point do you need to do that? Well, when you're, you know, as Paul said, when you're starting to tour, and you're going out on tour, and you're becoming more high profile, and things are starting to happen, then you probably should, instead of doing a sole proprietorship, essentially, which is what you are now, essentially start looking at a limited liability company or an S corporation or something like that where you will have some limitation of liability, but oh, and it, when you tour, I think um, Perry made a great point, you still have to have insurance. You still have to have personal injury insurance and all those that good stuff if you're touring. If you're not touring, you're really not doing anything um, other than you, know, you have this coming out, you have a holiday song coming out, you've got your publishing company, you've got your name going. What you really need probably is, I don't know what you're doing, marketing, but that's usually what you, you really need more than that. LLC right now. Um, Perry, I want to add there real quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not about that, but about uh, just to have, it's a business. I mean, everybody gets into this because they love music, they want to write music, they want to be on stage, they want to record. But you really have to take care of the business, otherwise, <laughs> huh? <laughs> otherwise you have, you really have to take care of the, at least the basics of the business. You get a basic accounting program, you get a quick in or a quick books, and, and pay everything you can out of it. Anything business related, music related, you can run through that if you, get, if you can get a credit card and just use it for, for only for your music business stuff. They usually send you at the end of the year, they send you a summary of all your charges for the year. So that <coughs> so just keep track of everything, really. Try to be organized. It's, it's this publishing portion of that a separate checking account? And a separate, I mean, it can be combined, it can be separate. If I do an admin, it's only separate with a place is there any if that's on the table, should I have that set up in a special way? I mean, if you have QuickBooks account for your particular entity, you can have publishing income, you know, record income, foreign income. I mean, it doesn't, you don't have that separate thing for each other. I have a DBA, for example. You know, Mark Hero, I've been doing business as my publishing company. I've had it for 175 years. So, really, you know, I mean, all the money is for publishing business. All right, I think we're out of time. Uh, I want to thank my panelists. Uh, before we go, I want to remind everybody that this checklist is available on the Sound Exchange website. If you go to soundexchange.com and look under extras, you'll find it. And at the beginning, uh, I, I mentioned that this checklist was uh, something that was born out of a conversation that I had with Kristen Thompson, who's now in the room. Kristen, thank you.